<clears throat> and I see it's 9.30. Uh, and I may not have 45 minutes worth of material, and, and that's fine too, because if, if we finish up a little bit early, then we can just uh, prepare for, for uh, worship online a little early. That'll be fine too. Uh, let's bow and begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, uh, we just thank you on this Lord's Day morning that we can uh, can gather together using this technology uh, to keep it keep each other informed and to spend time together in your word. We ask that you bless our study as we begin to look at the book of, of Galatians and see how that might apply to us today as well as it did uh, in your first century church. Help us, Father, to be your church, uh, no matter where we are and what we're doing. Help us to shine our light for you. Uh, and we can only do this through your strength and your grace. And we're thankful for that, and we're thankful for your obedient son who, who rescued us by what he has done for us on the cross, and it's through him that we pray. Amen. Okay, Josh, if you're ready, whenever you're ready, um, let's try that screen share video that's an overview of, of the book of Galatians. Paul's letter to the Galatians. It was written to a number of churches in the region of Galatia where Paul had traveled on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the stories in the book of Acts. He wrote this important letter from a place of deep passion and frustration. Here's the backstory. Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem, but its message was for all humanity, and so it quickly spread beyond Israel. By Paul's time as a missionary, there were as many non-Jews as there were Jewish people in the Jesus movement, and this sparked a huge debate that we know about from the book of Acts chapter 15. Historically, the covenant people of God were focused in one ethnic group, Israel, and they were set apart by the practices commanded in the Torah, like circumcision of males, eating kosher, observing the Sabbath. And there were many Jewish Christians who believed that for all of these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family, they needed to obey the laws of the Torah. And so some of these Jewish Christians ended up coming to the Galatian churches. They were undermining Paul and demanding circumcision of all these male non-Jewish Christians. And so many of them were. And when Paul found out, he was brokenhearted and angry. And this letter is the result. He first challenges the Galatians with his summary of the gospel message about the crucified Messiah. He then argues that this gospel is what creates the new multi-ethnic family of Jesus and Abraham. And then he shows how this gospel is what truly transforms people by the presence and power of the Spirit. He opens by expressing his bewilderment that the Galatians have embraced a different gospel. It's the one promoted by these Christians who badmouth Paul and demand circumcision. So Paul first defends the authenticity of his message and authority as an apostle. He was commissioned by the risen Jesus himself to go to the non-Jewish world. Remember the story from the book of Acts. Paul says it was only later that he went to Jerusalem to consult the other apostles like Peter or James. And when he told them he wasn't requiring non-Jewish Christians to be circumcised or eat kosher, they were in full support. But this tension ran deeper. Peter had come to Antioch to visit and see all of these non-Jewish Christians, and he was eating and mingling with them. But when some of this Jerusalem opposition group showed up in Antioch, Peter caved under their pressure. He stopped eating with these uncircumcised Christians, and he was avoiding them. And so Paul confronted and accused Peter of hypocrisy, of not staying true to the gospel. For Paul, demanding these new Christians to become circumcised and Torah observant, it's wrong-headed for all kinds of reasons. First of all, because it's a betrayal of the gospel. Or in his words, people are not justified by the works of the Torah, but rather by the faith of Jesus the Messiah. And we have faith in the Messiah Jesus. To be justified, or literally to be declared righteous, it's a rich Old Testament term for Paul. It's when God declares that someone is in a right relationship with him. They're forgiven, they're given a place in God's family, and they are being transformed by God's grace. And it's Paul's conviction that no one can be justified by observing the commands of the Torah, but only by the faith of Jesus. This is a dense phrase, and it could refer to Jesus' own faithfulness in living and dying on our behalf, 
or it could refer to our own trust and devotion to Jesus. Either way, the point is clear. People are justified only through trusting in what God did for them through Jesus, not by what they do for themselves. At the heart of Paul's gospel is this claim that when people trust in the Messiah Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. His life, death, and resurrection become theirs. Or in his words, I've been crucified with the Messiah, and it's not I who come back to life, it's the Messiah living in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the reason anyone can say that they are right with God or belong to Jesus' covenant family, it's not because they obeyed the laws of the Torah. It's only because of what Jesus did for them that they could never do for themselves. Now, this profound understanding of what Jesus accomplished, it has huge implications for who can now be included in God's covenant family and for what it means to live as a member of that family. So Paul first turns to the stories about Abraham in Genesis, how he was justified or declared righteous before God by simply having faith, by trusting in God's promise that one day all nations would find God's blessing through him and his offspring. God's purpose was always to have one large multi-ethnic family of people who relate to him on the basis of faith, not on the laws of the Torah. But that raises an important question. Why did God give the laws of the Torah to Israel then? Here Paul offers a very brief and dense explanation that he will later fill out in his letter to the Romans. He observes that the laws of the Torah were given to Israel at Mount Sinai long after God's promise to Abraham. And if you read the Torah carefully, he says, you'll see that God always intended the laws to be a temporary measure. He says the laws had both a negative and a positive role. Negatively, the laws acted like a magnifying glass on Israel's sin. They exposed how Israel shared in the sinful human condition, constantly rebelling against God's law. And so the law, which is good, ended up pronouncing Israel guilty and all humanity with them. Or in his words, the laws imprisoned everyone under the power of sin. But the laws also had a positive role. They acted like a strict school teacher that kept Israel in line until the coming of the promised offspring of Abraham, the Messiah. And once the Messiah came, he fulfilled the purpose of the laws on Israel's behalf. Jesus was the faithful Israelite who truly loved God and neighbor. And as Israel's king, he died to take the curse and consequence of Israel's failure into himself and bring redemption. And so now through Jesus, the offspring of Abraham, God's blessing can come to all people, regardless of their ethnicity, social status, or gender. For Paul, requiring Torah observance from non-Jewish Christians, it makes no sense. It's acting as if Jesus didn't fulfill God's promise or deal with our sins. It neglects the new freedom gained for us through Jesus and the gift of the Spirit, and it limits God's promise and blessing to one ethnic family. But, Paul's opponents might argue, the laws of the Torah, they're a proven guide to living according to God's will. How will non-Jewish Christians learn this? Paul responds in chapters 5 and 6 by describing how Jesus' transforming presence through the Spirit is the key. The laws of the Torah are good. They're wise, Paul says. In fact, they can all be summarized, as Jesus did, in the command to love your neighbor as yourself. But the laws, good as they are, they did not give Israel the power to obey them. In contrast, the good news is that Jesus did fulfill the laws on our behalf, and now he lives in us through the Spirit, making his people into new humans who fulfill the law by loving others. So Paul goes on to contrast this old and new humanity. The habits of the old humanity are obvious. These are behaviors that dehumanize people, they destroy relationships and whole communities. And while the laws of the Torah prohibited these behaviors, Jesus actually put them to death on the cross. So when a person trusts in Jesus and lives in dependence on the Spirit, his life becomes theirs and produces what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. This is Jesus' way of life that he wants to reproduce in his family so that they become people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But this fruit isn't automatic, Paul says. It requires cultivation just like real fruit. Or in his words, if we live by the Spirit, we have to keep in step with the Spirit. 
This requires intentionality. We have to learn how to prune off our old habits and cultivate new ones. And as we do so, we find ourselves carried along by the Spirit as Jesus reshapes our minds and hearts and makes us into people who love God and others. And in this way, Jesus' people fulfill what Paul calls the Torah of the Messiah. In the end, Paul concludes, this requirement for Christians to become Torah observant or be circumcised, it's an adventure in missing the point. What really matters is God's new creation, this new multi-ethnic family of the Messiah, people full of faith in Jesus who are learning to love God and others in the power of the Spirit. And that's what the letter to the Galatians is all about. Well, that worked really well. I hope you all enjoyed uh, that. Uh, those of you that are, are joining by phone, you missed a treat there because that while the speaker is uh, explaining the summary of the book, he's actually doing a full page illustration as well. It makes it very easy to understand. Um, and <clears throat> that, is, that is put on by the Bible Project. You can find those videos on Right Now Media. Each of us have a membership to that. Uh, if you're not using that, you're missing out on a great deal of, of uh, material. Please use that. Um, you can also look these up on YouTube as well. Just search for the book that you'd like a summary of and the Bible Project, and, uh, and you'll, you'll be able to watch these videos. They're, they're very biblically correct and uh, very um, informative and easy to understand. Uh, hope you all enjoyed that. And that gives us an overview of the whole book of Galatians. <clears throat> uh, Galatia was a Roman province in Central Asia Minor. Paul traveled there on each of three of his missionary journeys that he made to spread the news about Jesus, to spread the gospel. There were four churches mentioned in Galatia, and you can read about this in Acts 13 and 14, chapters 13 and 14 of Acts. They are Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Those were the names of the churches that Paul, uh, on his missionary journeys, actually planted these churches. And as he did his subsequent journeys, he checked back up on them each time that he passed through. The Galatians received both Paul and his gospel announcement warmly. But later, some people that Paul calls agitators, uh, they came and challenged his leadership as well as his foundation of, of his teachings. So Paul wrote the, the book of Galatian to answer this threat to his authority and to the gospel that he had preached to, uh, and to reaffirm the core message of the gospel. Uh, the faith, that faith in the Messiah is the basis of membership in God's new community. Uh, Paul doesn't open this letter by appealing to the apostles in Jerusalem. Instead, he insists that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. Rather, I received it from Jesus himself by direct revelation. Paul was compelled to share this revelation and he notes that the other apostles support him. Paul then proceeded into his main argument in chapter one, which is that the Gentiles who have become followers of Jesus do not need to be circumcised. Uh, this new worldwide family that had been promised to Abraham is created by faith in Messiah Jesus, not by keeping Jewish law, the Torah. The biblical story had been pointing to this all along. And some of the opposers would say, but, by, but if not following the Torah is not the basis of the gospel, won't there be uh, confusion? How will people know how to live? Paul answers by describing that the spirit-empowered life, what it looks like for the spirit-empowered life, what it looks like in community of the Messiah followers. Paul closes by emphasizing 
the main theme of this letter once more. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. And Paul is pointing to this new multi-ethnic family, uh, our creation in Christ. And you'll read about that in Galatians 6.15. That's kind of an overview of the book. Uh, and as we get into chapter one, I'll be covering the first 10 verses this morning. <clears throat> and then subsequent, about, there's about two lessons for each chapter. So there's six chapters, so we have about six less, or 12 lessons in the six chapters. <clears throat> Let's begin by looking at verse one and two. And I'm reading out of the NIV. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. So right away, Paul establishes his authority as apostles, as an apostle, uh, that he's been given his knowledge and commissioned to share this gospel mission to the Gentiles, by direct revelation of Jesus himself. We'll read about this more later in, in chapter one, verses 11 and 12 state that. And that God the Father who raises Jesus from the dead, not sent by men, not men from Jerusalem or anywhere else, not sent by a man, not one of the apostles or anyone else, but sent by God the Father, and through Jesus, and by Jesus the Son. It's interesting to note here the language when he, when he talks about all of the brothers and sisters with me in Galatia, to the churches in Galatia. This is a Greek word, and I, I don't know how to pronounce this exactly. I think it's Adelphoi, uh, A-D-E-L-P-H-O-I. It is a Greek word that literally means from the same womb. So when he talks about brothers and sisters in Christ, think about this as when he says brothers and sisters all throughout this book, uh, all throughout the book of Galatians. There's, there's twice in chapter one that he uses it, uh, once in chapter three, once twice in chapter three times in chapter four, uh, once in twice in chapter five and twice in chapter six. So every time you see brothers and sisters, Think about that close bond that a brother and sister from the same womb would have. Think about the relationship that we have in Christ as being that close brother and sister relationship. Now, we're going to move into uh, verses 3, 4, and 5, and then we're at the same time, we're going to kind of be looking at the, uh, the questions that were sent out through through email, or you may have received them uh, in the mail with your bulletin this week. And by the way, we'll try to send those out uh, weekly so that you can actually spend a little bit of time looking at those questions, reading that part of the chapter, and studying ahead for each class that we have during the next 12 weeks. Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse four, for who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God, our father. Verse five, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you look at, at question one on the, uh, on the study guide that was sent out, what did Jesus voluntarily do for Paul and the Galatians? And then it gives you a hint. The answer is in verse four. What does Jesus do for us? Verse four. Anyone? Gave himself for us. He gave himself for us on the cross. He did. Uh, and that's, that's how Paul begins. He, he, he's Christ-centered. Uh, this message, this gospel, uh, verse 4 said that he rescues us 
from this present evil age. He rescued us from our sins because of what Christ done for us on the cross by the will of God the Father. So Christ voluntarily obeys God will, God's will by doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Um, this greeting also, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this establishes the authority by which Paul writes. His authority was being um, challenged by these agitators, by these Judaizers, and they were actually coming in and changing Paul's message. And this is what he's refuting, but he starts off right away by saying that he has the authority from God. He is commissioned by God, given this knowledge, this gospel by Jesus himself. And this is, is the letter that he's writing to them to correct uh, these things that are going on in Galatia. Let's move into verse six, and this will hey, have Rob. with question two of the discussion. Yes, someone? Oh, I was going to say, uh, can you hear me okay on this, on this device? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, I was wondering, uh, Josh has talked to us often about the importance of the resurrection. Um, that word you were using earlier about the same womb, it also in that verse talks about the resurrection. Uh, I'm kind of drawing that parallel that maybe that's the womb he's talking about, that the resurrection um, is our source of connectedness. Just, I'm just, just curious, and it kind of fits with uh, uh, the answer to the question you just uh, asked as well, but just curious about people's thoughts. I would have to agree with that. Uh, that is the way that he rescued us. It was through his death, burial, and especially his resurrection that makes us uh, participants in his death, burial, and resurrection. And, uh, and we'll find out a little later in the book how he connects baptism to that as well. But, but that connectiveness is through Jesus and what he's done for us specifically pointing directly to the resurrection. I think that's a great point, Mike. Thank you for that. Any other comments before we look at verse six? All right, let's look at verse six. And here, uh, Paul gets, after the greeting, he goes right into the message that he needs to talk to the Galatians about. Verse six and seven together. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the, in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some, of, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. How would you feel, look at, look at the question number two on the, on the study there, how would you feel if our preacher began a sermon this way, the way Paul did in this letter? What, how does Paul sound to you uh, by jumping right into, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the gospel that I preach to you. Does he sound a little upset? Well, he comes across very blunt or controversial, so it's it's like he's trying to elicit a reaction from the group. It is very pointed, very blunt, very to the point. Uh, I can I can hear Paul's passion. I can hear his anger, his frustration with them, his disappointment with them. Uh, he's, he's pretty much giving these guys down the road. He's getting their attention very quickly about how they have erred from the gospel and how important it is to hold to that gospel. Wouldn't you agree? Now, these, uh, we'll, we'll read a little bit more in chapter two and, and a couple subsequent lessons from now that the men that he's talking about here 
um, you might, in, in the book of Galatians, it's, they're called um, the circumcision group or the circumcision party. Uh, it doesn't use the word Judaizers in, in the book of Galatians per se, but that's who he's talking about because these, these were Jewish Christians that held to the Torah. They, they didn't turn loose of, of the things that, the other things that the law taught. And we'll read more about that as, as we go along in Galatians, but these, these, um, these Judaizers were coming in and preaching that in order to be a Christian, you had to be a Jew first. In order to be saved, that circumcision was part of the salvation process. And Paul is refuting that. Uh, we read in Acts 15 how, how this actually came to a head, this um, council at Jerusalem where, where Paul and Barnabas had to go to to meet the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, James and Peter and the others. And they had this big conference about what do we do about this? Because this is not the gospel I had been given. This is not the gospel that I was told to preach to the Gentiles. These are the things that are happening among us as we teach to the, to the, to the Gentiles, how we see the spirit coming on the Gentiles. Everything pointed to the fact that circumcision was not required. Yes, Tony, you have a comment? Uh, yes, uh, Paul was addressing people back then because people back then are like people today. They, they want to listen to the world, the worldly gospel instead of, instead of Jesus, instead of from the Bible. They want to listen to other worldly uh, you know, stuff that people say that is about Jesus instead of through the Bible. And that's what Paul was referring to about you're listening to other things that aren't true that instead of listening to what I tell you about what Jesus uh, says that is the truth. And that's the way we are today that a lot of the uh, and Christians including the go to church, they, they'd rather listen to the world instead of listening to what's being preached in church. The truth about Jesus, and they want to listen to the world. And that's why we have, well, you know, recent like protests and stuff like that because, you know, they'd rather listen to the world instead of Jesus. And that's, that's why it's so important for us to read our Bibles. And that's why it's so important for us to understand what our Bibles are telling us what the gospel is. Because that's exactly what Paul is refuting. These people had either added to the gospel or they were trying to pervert the gospel. And this was something that Paul could not allow to happen. And this was very on, very early on in the first century church. It's interesting to to understand that the first attack on the first century church came from within. It was opinions. It was opinions of men that was perverting the freedom of the gospel that Paul and Peter were preaching. It's, uh, and we have this same struggle today. It's called legalism. It's, it's, it's Jesus plus keeping a set of rules. It's Jesus plus circumcision. It's Jesus plus following dietary laws. It's the same thing that they were dealing with then, and it's very timely today because I think we struggle with this very same thing even today. Thank you for your comment, Tony. It's right on point here because um, uh, Galatians is very uh, useful to us today because we struggle with some of the same things when it comes to keeping the gospel pure. Uh, let's read our Bibles and let's understand the freedom that we have in Christ, the, the gospel that, that was preached in the first century, and let's keep to that without adding all of these other things or requiring additional things in order for men to obey the gospel. Roger, he, he actually... Well, as you get a little farther on, he 
you can tell that Paul is angry and he tells him in verse six, he's astonished that you are so quickly deserting. And the thing about it is, and the thing we've got to watch for today too, is that it makes sense to these people. There's, I mean, they know that there's the law and, and they are, they have now become Christians and it makes sense to them that these people are saying, okay, you can be a Christian, but you got to follow the law. You got to be circumcised. You got to follow the dietary um, restrictions. It, and it, you know, in, in their heads saying, well, yeah, do you know, that kind of makes sense. And he's taking a, one thing and trying to add something to it and, and get what they want. And we will deal with this as we finish, as we get deeper into Galatians, uh, chapters, uh, Two and three and four deal more about one and two deal with uh, with Paul's authority, the thought, the authority that he had given, the gospel that had been taught to him by Jesus himself by revelation. It was not taught to him by any man. Uh, so he establishes that authority. Then in verse in the chapters three and four, he talks about the law. He talks about how the law is good, but he also talks about the freedom that we have and how Christ fulfilled the law for us and set us free from the law because we can't keep the law perfectly. Christ did, but we cannot. And then verses, I mean, chapters five and six get into how we are to live, and that is to live by the Spirit, not live by a set of rules. The law is good. We need those laws. We need those laws to define to us what sin is, but keeping a set of rules is not the way that we obtain salvation. The way that we obtain salvation is through our faith in Jesus Christ, who obtained our salvation for us by what he did for us on the cross that we could not do for ourselves. This is a wonderful book. We're just scratching the surface of it today. And uh, this is a great introduction, I think, to the entire book. And all of these questions will be answered uh, as we go through all of the chapters of this book in the next few weeks. I'm looking forward to getting in, into it even deeper. Um, because of time, let's move on to uh, verses 8 and 9. And this will correspond with question 4 on your study guide. Uh, verse, verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As I have already said now, so now I also say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than you accepted, let them be under God's curse. And depending on which version of NIV you're reading or what other version this God's curse means eternally condemned. So looking at verse or the question four, what does Paul say would, would happen to anyone who promotes and teaches a gospel other than which the, the gospel that Paul preached, the good news of grace? What would happen or what should happen to someone who preaches a different gospel? Paul says you'll be judged guilty. Your version said judge guilty. Uh, the NIV says they would be under God's curse or eternally condemned. This is pretty strong language, isn't it? What does it say about, first of all, the importance of the gospel? And secondly, what does it say about changing that gospel? How serious is that? Could it not cost someone their soul? If we get the, the doctrine wrong, if we get the gospel wrong, couldn't that cost us our eternal salvation? Isn't that what verses 8 and 9 are saying? Yes. It's very serious here. And Paul's being very serious with them on purpose. Any other comments before we look at verse 10? Again, it goes it, back to... What the world says tries to say about the gospel instead of what Jesus says about the gospel, 
That's and right. If we listen to the world instead of listening to Jesus through people like Josh, then God's going to judge us guilty because it's going to be the wrong type of message. So we should listen to Jesus through people like Josh. It's very important to get the message right. And uh, we cannot allow uh, the gospel to be changed by either our feelings or our wants or what we prefer or listening to someone else says if it conflicts with the, the gospel message that we have through the written word. Uh, I'm convinced that God has given us what we need to have through the written word, and that's what we have to go by. And the only way for us to know that is to spend time there, to read it, to know it, and to test those things that we have heard to make sure that they are correct because our souls, our salvation, depend on it. It's that serious. Roger. Yes. It may not be so much what we call false teaching. Um, somebody has a different opinion about the millennium or some doctrine like that, but yet they have the message of the gospel correct. Um, and we, we disfellowship over trivial matters where we should be disfellowshipping over a major matter. Does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. And there are, there are so many things that are a matter of opinion. And, but we want to make it more than just a matter of opinion. We want to make it a matter of our theology. Uh, I think we, and, and if you've heard, you've heard us say this to several times, we draw our circle too small. We draw our circle way too small. We have much in common with, with others that have the basic gospel right, but they differ with us on matters of opinion. We're, we're very lucky about that, and we want to we rule them out because they disagree with us because of the way we worship or because of, of uh, matters of, of exactly what you had brought up, Greg. I think I the think problem today, I don't have that answer exactly other than we need to be more tolerant and, and maybe be a little more inclusive with the folks that have the basic gospel right. Um, hey, Roger. Yes, go ahead. I would agree with Greg. I, I've got a, I've got a list of, oh, I think it's 150, 160 things that Churches of Christ have split over, over the years, and I think it's probably longer since that was made. Um, and it's a lot of it's just silliness. Uh, another thought I had is about um, we don't need to discount everything the world says. Um, some of the things the world's saying right now through protest is right on and lines up with Jesus and the gospel. Uh, so, I mean, that, that, and there's some things that aren't. So you got to be, you know, I, I mean, the world can open our eyes to things sometimes as well. That's where we have to be very vigilant. Uh, as, we're, as we're being open-minded, we still have to be very vigilant and um, and open to uh, an interpretation of the gospel that we may not have understood that way before. Uh, and, it, and if it is a matter of opinion or if it's a matter of expediency, then uh, I think it would be good for us to be open-minded about that and, and not jump to condemnation as our first reaction to something that's new. Um, Josh, you got a comment? Look, you look, you just look like you might have a comment. Well, I, I was just kind of thinking, um, I appreciate where Greg was leading us because um, I do think that we we lose we lose sight of what the gospel and the importance of that message is. And I think we do become um, a phrase I've heard is you major and minors and minor and majors. And and you know, Mike was leading us into that same thought too. So that was, that was where I was going. They, they both beat me to the punch. Stealing. Hey, 
Hey, Roger. Yes, go ahead. Hey, it's Michelle Day. And just a couple of thoughts that I have on the discussion. One is I heard this a couple years ago and it's so, it resonates with me the more that I study the Bible because the more that I study it, the more I realize I don't know. And it, it also convicts me to continue the study to try to learn and grow to be more like Jesus. But what I heard was the scriptures are perfectly true, but they're not always perfectly clear. And I, I always, and I heard this too, and it resonates with me, is that am I trying to be right in my walk with fellow men or am I trying to be righteous? And when we look at example after example after example, Jesus's approach with people was always to bring them to salvation, always to bring light into their lives for them to have a better life here and ultimately eternal life. And I just think about that so much in today's world and in Paul's later letter to the Galatians in that there is a message of truth here, but in Romans, it also talks about getting caught up in disputable matters. Mm -hmm. And we, as Christians, we really need to convict ourselves to study the word and pray that our heart is sincere and genuine and that we are trying to bring light and righteousness to the world, not our own self-fulfilling being right. And I think Jesus obviously is the ultimate example of that. And Paul too is an example of that. Uh, amen, Michelle. Um, I, I wish I could have said it as well as you just said that because that is right on point. Uh, it is right on our discussion that we're talking about in the book of Galatians and, and in the broader sense of, of how we do. Uh, uh, Roger. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it summarizes as you're getting to in, in verse 10. And we see it in the world today with the riots and people following men as well as in the church and, and put men on a pedestal in the religious world and we're all sinners. But the Bible talks about in verse, we try to please men. And that is such a challenge not to fall in line with everything in the world does and not to keep a stand on where we really truly should be. And I think all the time of the scripture, all men's ways seem innocent to him. We do it innocently a lot of times, but his motives are judged by the Lord, just like Michelle said. God knows the heart of man and why he's doing what he's doing. And people follow religion, which is man-made, and try to please men. And we have to understand God's mission is to save the world through Jesus Christ and not trying to save it through us by pleasing other people. Very good. Uh, I, re I really appreciate all the comments this morning. Uh, I think they're right on point. I think it's very timely that we'd be discussing these things, uh, especially what's happening around us today. Let's look at verse 10 very quickly and finish up, uh, and then we'll get uh, move on to worship time. Verse 10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is not trying to win a popularity contest here. If he were, uh, it would be much easier for him to just do what pleases men rather than what he feels he must do to be a servant to Christ. He suffered because of but his convictions and what he was preaching. Uh, so he's not trying to win a popularity contest here. He's not trying to listen to men. He's trying to listen to Christ, his savior. And he's the one that commissioned him to, to bring the gospel uh, to, the, uh, to the Gentiles. As we, as we finish the intro in the first 10 verses of the book of Galatians, I just want to remind us that near the end of the book, in, in Galatians 6.15, uh, Paul brings it back around to sum it up like this. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. 
What counts is the new creation. Paul is pointing to the new family, the new multi-ethnic family of God, and how we are born into this family, how we are a new creation in Christ. And that's what matters, not what these men were trying to say about circumcision or uncircumcision, and bringing conflict into the church, and really perverting the gospel. We'll read uh, as we get into further chapters about, um, about how we're to live by the Spirit and how we have that freedom in Christ and how that Spirit living in us teaches us uh, to obey uh, God and to help us along the way because we are imperfect people. We can no way earn it. We cannot do enough good. There's, that is not the gospel. Uh, we cannot earn our way to heaven. Uh, that is a gift. It is by grace that we are saved through faith in what Jesus has done for us. That completes our lesson today. It's about 1015. So uh, let's use this time to uh, transition into morning worship. God bless everybody. Glad to see everybody. Josh, you have a closing comment?